Facing the aftermath of the American Civil War, hurricanes, and the devastating earthquake of 1886, Charleston, South Carolina struggles to rebuild. For African Americans living in Charleston, the struggle for survival was even more dire due to continued racism, the implementation of Jim Crow laws, and little to no access to education. Our archives are filled with the tragic accounts of that era, but within these documents, there are remarkable stories of perseverance and achievements, especially within the African American community. This is the story of Reverend John L. Dart and his daughter, Susan Dart Butler, and their enduring legacy for education and equality for all citizens of Charleston, South Carolina. John Lewis Dart was born a free person of color in 1854 in Charleston, South Carolina. He was an exceptional student at the Avery Normal Institute, one of the first free secondary schools for African Americans founded in 1865 by Francis Cardozo. Cardozo, a prominent African American and well-educated, established the school to train teachers and believed education should be one's highest priority. In 1872, John Lewis Dart graduated valedictorian from the Avery Normal Institute's first graduating class. He graduated from the Avery Institute during Reconstruction in the early 1870s. And at that time, Reconstruction, a period where you actually had a black lieutenant governor and the person of Alonzo J. Ranzier, as well as African Americans going to the University of South Carolina for a four-year period from 1873 to 1877, with Richard T. Greener as a black professor and so forth. He came of age in the midst of all of that. So that had an effect on have, having an unlimited horizon when it comes to what he wanted to accomplish. He really believed that a lot of things were possible. Now, with the succeeding generations, there was a loss of hope and a loss of vision and a loss of belief in possibilities. Places like Charleston limited the education that black people could receive because they feared the rise of an educated black class would cause a loss in cheap labor because up to that point, black people were not able to go past the sixth grade or in some cases, even the third grade in many parts of rural South Carolina. In fact, it was a common practice for them to take black children out of school during the harvesting and cotton periods so that the children could work in the fields. John Lewis Dart continued his education at Atlanta University in Georgia and continued on to study at the Newton Theological Seminary in Massachusetts, where he was ordained a Baptist minister. He continued to work in Boston, Washington, D.C., and at the Atlanta University in Georgia. But he came back, and he came back to a community that was in need, and he came back armed with the desire to help that community, help this community, help the people um, who had essentially been the reason he became who he became. You know, um, he was born a free man of color. And for him to be raised with that consciousness that being free meant something, that being educated meant something, that being literate was something worth fighting for and dying for and living for even, that was serious. And so at that um, critical space in his life, he became a catalyst for extreme change in Charleston um, by coming back. So in the early part of 1893, a Charleston businessman named John Thompson died, and it was discovered that his will instructed his executors to leave a great deal of money to the city of Charleston to be used for the public benefit. And immediately people wrote letters to the editor, putting in their two cents of how the people in the community thought that that money should be used. And among those people who wrote in to the Charleston News and Courier was Reverend Dart. He said, we absolutely need schools to educate young black children, to make sure that they're not falling into a life of crime. So Reverend Dart 
put forth the idea in the spring of 1893 that some of that Thompson bequest money should be used to fund the already seriously underfunded black schools in the city of Charleston. And he said that humanity demands that we make this change. And he's writing as a citizen of the United States and as a citizen of Charleston, trying to exercise his rights really as a human being. And unfortunately, the city ignored his request. Recognizing that public schools for black children were inadequate and severely overcrowded, Reverend Dart worked diligently to correct this injustice. Funded in large part by Reverend Dart himself, along with prominent African-American citizens in the community, and using his own land on Cracky Street, he established the Charleston Normal and Industrial Institute in 1894. And he was facing the odds of a political system that really wasn't interested in funding black schools and a, a community that really didn't have much money. But through his uh, ingenuity and perseverance, he brought people together and he convinced them that we could do this. He let education and excellence be a standard. He didn't just create space, he created a school. And then after that, purchased more lots in that area to create even a, more, a bigger school. So children are being taught to read and write and mathematics, but then they're also learning a trade, whether it's bricklaying or pr plaster work or uh, iron work. You know, think about Charleston's legacy of African-American blacksmiths. That was definitely part of the curriculum, but also farming, culinary skills, uh, cooking and sewing and millinery and other things for both boys and girls. So not only is it a school where they're teaching children, but they're actually uh, having practical instruction in things like printing. And so the industrial school has its own printing press and they're publishing a newspaper like other uh, what they call colored industrial schools throughout the South. So they're providing not only an education and work for young adults, but they're also uh, creating part of the community. You know, they're giving back to the community and showing young children that there's, you know, a, a ladder of progression to being a student, to being a, a functioning member of society. I have visited Reverend John L. Dart's school in Charleston, South Carolina, and I feel that Mr. Dart is doing a good and much needed work among the colored people in that vicinity. And I am sure that any help given him will be used in a way to accomplish good in the upbuilding of our people in that part of the South. Booker T. Washington. For years, Reverend Dart fought and insisted that the city of Charleston should financially support the education for black students as they did for whites. The success of his school was a shining example of what schools for children of color in Charleston should be. What Reverend Dart accomplished could no longer be ignored. And that Normal and Industrial Institute became the basis of what later would be Burke High School. But he did that, like, of his own thought, raising private dollars, had petitioned the city to educate these people, educate my people, educate our people, our children of this community need to be educated in a school regularly not hidden, and even before it would be done by others, they did it. He created not just a school, but a, really a business model uh, to make sure that it was funded and it would operate as a proper school and um, fulfill its objective. And starting in the mid-1890s and going well into the 20th century, it sure did succeed. He created a legacy in this area that would even transcend his own personal amazing story. He created something that we still celebrate today. Like her father, Susan Dart Butler attended Avery Institute and furthered her education to become a teacher at Atlanta University. In 1908, she relocated to Boston to attend McDowell Millinery School, 
a school for learning the craft of hat making. There she met and soon married Nathaniel Lowe Butler and began her career as a milliner. She returned to Charleston in 1913. Her husband assisted Reverend Dart in maintaining the school, and Susan resumed her career as a milliner. Soon, her business began to thrive, making her the first African-American maker and designer of hats in Charleston. But like her father, Susan Dart Butler could no longer ignore the social ills that continued to plague the African-American community. In the fall of 1925, after making a quick survey of libraries or bookshelves in schools and churches of Charleston, I found there was very little to report on the number or kind of books in those bookcases. One cold night before this survey was made, a young high school girl attending Avery came to my house to inquire as to whether I had the poems of Shelley and Keats and their biographies. My father, the Reverend Dart, had collected a large number of books for his library, and I knew these books were among them. The girl went with me to his library. The room was very cold, but the girl said she did not mind the cold. She would rather sit there and read, because at her home, a small cottage, there were her sister's young children playing and older folk talking, which made it hard for her to concentrate on her work. This picture was always in front of my eyes. I knew her situation and thought of many others like her. Where could we start the reading room? The catalyst for her starting the reading room was a, was, um, a request from an Avery student who needed um, some books for a class that she was taking and, and did not have access to those. And, and Mrs. Butler knew that those books were in the collection of, of her late father, Reverend Dart. And so even, so, you know, the assumption there being that even at the Avery, where the student was studying, those resources weren't available there either. Um, so it just, um, there weren't a whole lot of resources, library resources available for somebody who was not uh, wealthy and white. This is all of her family's own materials that she's using and making those available to the community. Um, and then of course, over time, you know, as more people see what she's doing and become invested in it, then she gets more from the community. But, but to start with, this is, this is her, you know, in a sense, her inheritance from her father. By 1927, and using much of her own funds, Susan Dart Butler opened the Dart Hall Reading Room for the African American community. Even though she was not a trained librarian, Susan continued to educate herself on how to operate, manage, and organize a library professionally. As the reading room continued to grow and demonstrate its importance in the community, it caught the attention of the leaders of the Rosenwall Fund. Susan Dart Butler's perseverance proved that a free library should exist for the African-American citizens of Charleston. Monies from the Rosenwall Fund were granted and in 1931, the Dart Reading Room became the Dart Hall branch of the Charleston Free Library System. So she's, a, she's an inspiration, and she's one of those unsung heroes, so to speak, because what she did was just so significant during a, a very um, hard time. And what she was able to do to rally the support, I mean, if, if you really think about it, she um, was able to connect with the communities around her in order to, to get funds to help, um, you know, stock the reading room at DART to get it started and to work through that entire process. I mean, she was an awesome businesswoman too, a politician, all of those things. But we are all grateful to her because not only was there nothing available for us as a black people, there wasn't anything available for us that was free. There was no Charleston free library system at all. So we all have to owe a debt of gratitude to Susan for her vision um, and her desire to help this community because since she, again, like her father, didn't commit to just doing a job, but committed to doing it with excellence, a basic tenet of what librarianship, particularly public librarianship, should be about. It's about 
it's about filling a need for your community. We, we work for our community and we support our community and that's, um, that's sort of a core of, li of public librarianship and so I, I've always been very drawn to Mrs. Butler and her story for that reason. It makes me, it makes me dig deep within myself. It makes me uh, uh, want to fight harder and to not lose all the work that she accomplished in such a hard time. It makes me realize as a librarian that I do have a lot to offer and that I can make a difference and that it does matter what I do and that even if it means touching one child, that makes a difference. It's kind of like the, uh, a pebble thrown in the water and uh, with the ripple effect. It was either 29, 1929 or 1930. I got my library card. That was a big thing for me. And I could go and get, I think, three or four books every two weeks at DART. And I did that on a regular basis. And I read in there, and I was always curious because when you went in, there was uh, Miss Susie sitting there at the desk letting you in and the door, big door on the right side, was adults reading room. And I always went into the general section where the children were in a regular public. And I said, one day I'm going in that adult room. That was mysterious. <laughs> it was like another world and a door to something else to me. And I always tell people, you know, I haven't gotten into the adult room yet. I remember her as, as being stern looking, but once you talked to her, she would kind of, you know, open up and smile, and so she, her exterior was a little more stern than she, than she actually was inside. She, she wanted kids to behave and you knew you weren't supposed to make noise and talk and all she and I think I realized that this this kept it a quiet place a peaceful place and it was run I guess like I imagine a library should have been run you know I would go stop by dart on my way home to read stuff we got out of school, I think it was about 2.30. And one day, oh, I may have been six or seven, I looked up, library was quiet, I'd gone in there, and there was my mother and Miss Susie, and the expression on her face, my mother's face, was one of terror. I had been in there, it was about 3.30 for over an hour, and they couldn't find me. And she said, boy, I've called the police department and the hospital. And then there was a relief between the two of them. I don't know what they said to each other. But I'd been in that corner behind her desk. I guess she couldn't see me. And I must have been seven, six, between about seven or eight maybe and just reading. I always had a pile of books and sometimes, you know, it was a question of getting, you know, because I walked there pretty much, getting them back and forth. So as I moved on to the bigger books, you know, it was, well, I guess I'll just take two because these are kind of heavy, <laughs> you know. But I knew I could, if I finished it, it two days I could get back quickly so it wasn't a matter of feeling well I'll, I'll run out of things to read and I won't be able to come back until Saturday when my mother can bring me see that was not a problem quiet gentle lady but I imagine determined but she was very quiet always pleasant welcoming and encouraging that constant quiet encouragement. Dahl Hall, Dot Hall was central. That was our library.
What I've come to realize is the radical discipline of women like Susie Dart Butler, my mother. My mother in Septima Clark came out of Avery in the same class in 1916. Those women, and they were predominantly women who came out of the Avery Institute, they had a radical endeavor to their work that addressed the institutional segregation oppression, denial of humanity to masses of young African-Americans. You talk about the public library idea. Folk came out of enslavement, went to the South Carolina State Legislature and insisted on a public education for black and white, male and female. And as that work sitting at that desk in that library, getting children to read, teaching them to read. You give a youngster the power of reading and you have put the world in his hand. That's a tremendous power. But you need to develop that with discipline, with patience, with great variety and expanse. You must read the literature of the world and then you can sort through what is garbage and what are gems. In 1968, the Dart Hall branch moved to a newly constructed facility at 1067 King Street and renamed the John L. Dart Library to honor Susan Dart Butler's father. Today, it continues to be an important resource for the Charleston community in all its diversity. I'm not sure if those who were doing all the surveying with the county knew exactly what they were doing when they put the Dart Library at 1067 King Street, but it is the sweet spot of the neighborhood. It um, is nestled between multiple houses of faith, different cultures of people in the community. Um, there are several schools ranging from preschools all the way up to high schools right within blocks within steps of this space, both private and public. So with that foundation of Susan Butler uh, being a librarian, which is pretty awesome, and being a part of establishing uh, the first African-American library, that continues because the John L. Dart Library still is the first, and I would have to say, um, in terms of its legacy and, and historical value and mark and resource is still considered the African-American library. One of the things that's very important for the Charleston County Public Library right now is to continue to build on diversity and cultural heritage and make sure that, uh, that the history is kept, that it's preserved, and that it's shared. I was away in Greenville uh, for uh, a pageant for my daughter. And we got on the elevator with another family and um, just asked a simple question like, oh, where are you guys from? And they said where they were from. And they asked and he said, Charleston. He said that the John L. Dart Library saved his life. And that every day when he got out of school, he went to the library. He went to the library to avoid a path of destruction, a pipeline to prison, getting in trouble. And he did just that. He went to school, he went to the library, he graduated, he went to the military, he started a family, and then here we were years later in an elevator together. And he had told his family, he had told his wife, he had told his daughter how important the library is but specifically how John L. Dart Library has saved his life. Among those killed in the Emanuel AME Church shooting was Cynthia Graham Hurd. For 31 years, she worked for the Charleston County Library System and proudly served as manager for the John L. Dart branch for many years, carrying on 
the Dart legacy. The, the type of person that um, Cynthia was, she was instantly your friend. She just instantly embraced you and walked you through whatever it was. And she would always give you the feeling that it was all right, that whatever it was, you would, you could accomplish it. So when I first started working at DART, she introduced me to the coworkers and she showed me where I was gonna sit. And then she said, let's go. And I said, go where? And she said, well, you can't know what we do until you know who we serve. Just getting to know what was going on in the neighborhood. We drove through neighborhoods where she showed me that, you see how they have you know, a lot of um, flowers on the porch and they have small gardens. So um, we wanna make sure that we keep books like that in the library. We keep subscriptions like that in the library. Um, do programming that people would be interested in. She noticed how there were toys that might be in a yard or a swing on a tree. And she would say, there's lots of young children in this neighborhood and see how there's cars in the driveway, but it's morning, there's at-home parents. So we wanna make sure that we have inviting story times for young people. And just doing that, what I would later find out is a needs assessment. And that's what Mrs. Cynthia Graham Heard taught me. It was that this position is one of service. I had applied for a position and I did not get the position that I had applied for. And she said to me, she, she said, Darlene, I know that you had applied for that, you know, I, I realized what happened, you didn't get the position. And she said, you know, you just need to remember that when something is delayed, it does not mean that it's being denied. Just wait and be patient. So when the opportunity came back and I ended up in that position, she came and she looked at me and she said, do you remember? And I said, yes. So that's Cynthia, Cynthia the encourager. And even though she is not here, her spirit lives on, her legacy lives on to encourage, to keep pushing forward, to keep growing, to keep learning. And in all that you do, you keep reaching for those young ones to make sure that they're in the fold, to make sure that they're getting what they need and to do whatever you need to do along the way to make sure that they're getting it. And so when I think about Cynthia and I think about libraries and life, I think about all those things. We're a smaller branch in the system, but that doesn't distract of how busy we are and how much work we do here and how we are a small staff but a lot of people are shocked when they find that out because of the programming that we're doing, um, the work that we're doing. Uh, we're, you know, constantly helping somebody, having to juggle multiple patrons at one time. Um, and I don't want people to lose sight of that, that despite us being a staff of, you know, five, we put out quality work. We help patrons here. I know we are busy here. When you look at the, the makeup of the community now, the Dart Library is being embraced by various um, folks from different cultures, different parts of the country coming in, and it's a wonderful thing. We're a community, commun more of a community feel um, here, um, more personal um, touch, um, but we, you know, we get the work done too. To, for DART not to exist would be a part of our history not to exist. So it, it, it is to all of our benefits, not just the African American community, because it's a part of all of our history. With the amazing work that the DART family did in this community and the legacy that they established by recognizing the need for public library services for African Americans, we'll continue with that legacy and making sure that we're providing access to library services to all patrons and that where we can, we'll be breaking down barriers to invite even more individuals to come and 
um, assist them in their quest for knowledge. I hear constantly how much the community appreciate Dart Library. Um, they want Dart Library here. They use it. Uh, we provide, you know, computers for someone who's looking for a job. Um, we provide that help to help them. Um, a place to just kind of wind down if they just want to play games on the computer. People to come grab their books. I mean, you know, it's a lot of people use this library for a lot of reasons. So I want to continue being a welcoming place for all. So the public library represents so much more than just a building filled with staff. It's, it's a building, um, it's the people's university, it's the people's community, and we want this to be the people's third space. Our staff is committed to our community's success, and we are here to break down barriers and to, wake, to welcome everyone. And we are more than honored to be here. I just, I didn't realize how it would affect us um, to see all of you here and for such a meaningful occasion. We especially appreciate this plaque highlighting the foresight of John L. Dart, but also the dedication and work of Susan Dart Butler. So often we've heard about the role of our great grandfather Dart and how he played and the role he played in establishing the Dart Hall and the Dart Library. Yet when our mother tells us stories, her stories are about Susie, Aunt Susie. And she always focused on Aunt Susie. We cannot honor Reverend John L. Dart without honoring his daughter, Susan Dart Butler. So I was just thrilled to hear uh, Elaine and, uh, I'm sorry, not Elaine, but Beverly and Carla uh, talk about Susan Dart Butler because she is really significant. And in the library world, she's a, our Wonder Woman. She's a, <laughs> our superhero. So, uh, so it is uh, our pleasure uh, to be a part of this and to really bring Susan Dart Butler out to the light. My mom, our mom, and she's celebrating her 90th year this year also. Um, the city of Char Charleston is honored and proud to have the John Dart Library as part of our community for so many years. We express our sincere congratulations, very best wishes for more successful years to come. Now, therefore, I, John J. Tecklenburg, Mayor of the City of Charleston, do hereby proclaim today, Saturday, December 9th, 2017, to be the John L. Dart Branch Library 90th Anniversary Day in the City of Charleston. Congratulations, all. Look at those accomplishments. At the early 20th century, of Reverend John Dart and Susan Dart Butler, even a century later, it's still well worth celebrating and, and commemorating their accomplishments because they stood up in the face of injustice and persevered against all odds and made a lasting contribution to the betterment of this community. There might be a lot of branches to something, but the, the root is what's really important. And the root for this system came out of the desire of a strong black woman who was the daughter of a strong black man and wife who came from strong people who had a desire to serve their community and uplift the community through literacy and education.